right, so we have done, this is week five. Week one, does anybody remember the memory verse from week one? I heard something. Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the abbreviated version, okay? Um, week two, James 5, 16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. Week three was 1 Peter 5, 8. The devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You don't want to be that one, do you? No. Week four. Last week was a little bit odd, odd the verse, but Hebrews 11:13. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. And you know, I, I love that verse because um, sometimes we pray until we're old and we haven't seen God do what we're believing Him to do. And, and God put this scripture, this chapter in the Bible to encourage us and I think it's really good for us to be encouraged because Abraham saw things afar off. Sometimes we see things that we're believing for way down the road, okay? And we haven't seen it yet. Veronica hasn't seen her family come to the Lord yet, but she's believing they're going to come. We're believing for loved ones that they're going to come to the Lord. And so that verse, I think, is a real encouragement to the, us that even though they died not seeing it, don't get discouraged in your prayers. You keep praying because the Bible says He stores up our prayers in a while. He saves those prayers. They're valuable to Him. So you keep praying because even after you're gone, your prayers are powerful. We have seen that here in our church. Today, uh, our verse is Malachi 4.6. And it says, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Oh my. Oh, that's a strong verse. That's a strong verse, isn't it? Yes, he is telling you as fathers and mothers, you turn your heart back to your children. Are you angry at your children? No. Do you point to bitterness against your children for things they've done? He wants you to turn back to your children, and then um, he will hopefully turn the children's hearts back to the fathers, because that's going to save a curse on this land. Do you know there's a there's the opportunity to to be angry with your kids? There was a story in the in the book. I don't know if you guys got it. Uh, we'll go over that a little bit about. Um, a family where the father realized he needed to turn his heart back to his son. So, uh, okay, today's uh, study is how do we spend time alone ourselves with God? Just creating a place for us to encounter God. Um, we have a, we've got a banner in the auditorium, a revival banner, and at the bottom of the banner is a heart with a flame coming out of it. And the symbolism is, we have to get that flame in us first. If we don't get that fire burning with us, we're not gonna start anything else on fire. The next picture, it goes up to a house. And when we get on fire for God, we're gonna set our family on fire for God. And when your families are on fire for God and you come to the church, which is the next thing, you're going to set this church on fire. And I mean, we need to be on fire. Not, not burning to burn down, but fire of the Holy Spirit, just burning with us. When we come, you know, we expect the pastor or the evangelist to bring that fire, you know, set us on fire. And God says, you start the fire. You start it. It's got to start in your heart. It's going to spread to your family, and when that happens, it's going to spread to the church. We have had people get so on fire for God and come into this church, and boy, they set everybody on fire. I remember one Sunday morning, Ashley leading, what was his name? 
What's that song? Victor's Crown. What's that? Victor's Crown. Victor's Crown. Oh my word, she was on fire that morning. <laughs> I have never forgotten it because it, <laughs> it set the whole place on fire when she was singing that. She had that. It was in her spirit so deep and she just was leading that from the depths of her being. And, and she set the whole place on fire, kid you not. It was awesome. Uh, but when you come with that spirit in you, and you share that with everybody else, when, when you go to Walmart and you are so on fire for God, you're going to touch people. You are going to make a difference in people's lives. Um, so, and then after the church, that fire goes up to the world. We're not going to set the world on fire until we do we just begin this progression and so i believe what we're studying today is so vital for our world you have the opportunity to change the world i have a little book my kids like to read the boy the boy who changed the world mm -hmm. and, and it talks about a little boy who um anyway his his inventions and, and his discoveries helped um, really change the world it's called the butterfly effect that a butterfly uh, flaps its wings on one side of the earth and begins begins uh, airwaves moving that are felt around the world. It's a great book. So um, you may think that you're just a butterfly, just flapping a few molecules of air, but you have the opportunity to set something in motion that can change the world. We never know. During um, the Yom Kippur War. How many of you got to see Golda? I know Lorraine saw that. Did anybody else see Golda? I would like to go see that movie. Uh, I've been so busy, I haven't been able to do it. But um, during that war, she called, I believe it was Richard Nixon was in office. And she called Richard Nixon. He was going through impeach. He was being impeached. He was headed out of office at that point. It was bad for him. But she called him and said, um, if we don't get help immediately, we will not exist by the end of this week. We have to have, and she gave him a list of equipment she needed, tanks and planes and ammunition. And, and he called the military and he gave them that list and he said, send all of it. Send all of it to her now. And he was very instrumental in saving the nation of Israel. He has a, he's got a, a bad rap. You know, nobody liked Richard Nixon, but I'm telling you, God used him. God used him when he was a little boy. His mother would pray with him, and she said, Richard, someday you're going to have the opportunity to help Israel. When that day comes, don't say no. Don't say no. That's all true. So, um, we never know how God is using people to be. Sometimes we think the biggest scoundrels in the world cannot be used by God, and yet they can. And yet they can. So we we're quick to judge, aren't we? All right. Um, you know, if you're ever going to get an altar established in your house, you're going to have to be the one that decides to do it. Uh, you, you may have a spouse that's very determined, and they may do it. But I'm just <laughs> encouraging you. You're the ones that are here. Um, Start it in your own home. How, how do we do that? Um, it, it, we have to think it through. It doesn't just happen. We have to make a plan. If anything's going to happen in my house, I've got to have a plan for it. Or it, it just doesn't do it itself by itself. My house does not clean, get cleaned by itself. Meals don't get cooked by themselves. Uh, beds don't get made. Nothing happens if I don't make a plan and follow it through. I have a day of the week I do my laundry every week. I change my sheets on that day every week. I give the dog a bath that day because when I, my sheets are clean and that dog sleeps with me, I want her to be clean too. <laughs> so, you know, we have a plan. We decide that precious baby back there, you've got such a plan for him. You know, if you don't plan for him, it's not going to happen, you know. And uh, so mothers are planners. We are nurturers and we are planners. You know, but it's entirely possible for us to plan so much, to be so busy, that we neglect our families. The ministry is one of the greatest places in the world to do that. You know, so many ministers lose their children because they're so busy ministering to everybody else's needs. They forget they've got a family at home. Um, 
right after Janine and Clint got married, um, Clint suggested, why don't we get together once a week to eat, just to get as a family. We have done that for over 20 years now, because he suggested it. I might not have come up with that on my own, but he suggested we do that. And I'm so grateful, because for, for all these years, once a week, we have a time set aside. We try not to violate that with other things. This, occasionally we will, this, um, for a conference, we won't be meeting, but we usually meet on Friday nights for a meal. And we just sit around the table as a family and talk and eat and enjoy each other's company. Sometimes we play games. Sometimes we're looking at what somebody's working on. Who knows? But we're together as a family once a week. And, and I think it's been very valuable to us as a family because there have been, not every week, but, but so often those are there are opportunities that come up when we're talking that that we can minister that we can we can pour into our children and our grandchildren and and frankly they pour into us very often as well it's a two-way street and and so it's been a real blessing for us and i just encourage you make time for your family if you if you want them to be part of your life you have got to make them part of your life when they're little when they're young if it's most of us are older in this room, and, and um, if that wasn't something you did when they were growing up, ask God to give you opportunities to show you, how do I make them part of my life now? How do, I, how do I redeem the time? What do I do now? It's not too late. I just want to encourage you. There was um, 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 a story in the book. Let's see, I'm getting ahead of my notes here. But there was a, a real precious story in the book about uh, Lou, where's, i got to find the name. There we go. John and Joelle Hamill. Um, they have a ministry in Washington, D.C., and yet uh, they were trying to figure out how do we get families praying, how do we, we need to get families praying for their families, and God began to spin, speak to John and told him, you can't develop this ministry until you get your own family where it needs to be. Um, God really wants us to minister to our families. It's not wrong to take time to minister to your own family. I just want to encourage you with that. That your other ministry, whatever it may be, is important. But God wants us to put into our families what's in our heart. And John and Joel had a son who was so on fire for the Lord and went away to a Christian college. And uh, professors tried to talk him out of his faith in God. Can you believe that? I mean, he should be fired on the spot. Fired on the spot. I just can't believe a Christian college would allow that in a classroom. <clears throat> Kids in the college introduced him to drugs and he came home not believing in God anymore. I can't think of anything more heartbreaking to somebody who thought they were giving their, their kids a good education, sending them to a good place and really watching over them and having them come back in this, this situation. But on Christmas morning, I think it was 2014, I think it was 2014, said, he and his wife decided, we're going to start praying for our son to come back to the Lord. And they started, uh, what, what do they call it, something Tuesdays, um, turnaround Tuesday. Um, so every Tuesday, they just spent that day interceding for their family. And one year later, to the day since, they, since the day they had determined they were going to start praying for their son, on Christmas morning, their son knocked on their door and early before they were awake and came into the room and he said, um, I just wanted you to know I've come home. He said, come home, he was at home. You know, come home, his dad didn't know what he was saying, but I've come home. Jesus came into my room. What a big come home. Um, there's no better story than that. No better Christmas. I started crying. There's no better Christmas, Christmas gift than that. And receiving your children back into the fold. And um, so they began this, this movement called Turnaround Tuesday, encouraging parents 
Spend Tuesdays in prayer, in prayer, in prayer. I don't know if there's anything special about Tuesdays, but um, there was another story earlier in the book about a, a woman whose kids were all grown, and she had invited them to her house on Tuesday for dinner, and she asked them to fast the two meals beforehand and, and how God just began to work. So maybe there's something really important about Tuesday with your family, okay? <laughs> so we'll try that. Um, you know, it's not always parents' faults when kids turn away from God. There are really good parents whose children have stopped following Christ. But I believe your prayers are so valuable. They can never get away from your prayers. Uh, I don't know if you've heard Jesse Duplantis' testimony about his mother <laughs> praying for him. He was a he was a um, he was a very talented musician, rock and roll musician, and um, but always out living the lifestyle. And uh, he would come in, and his mom would be praying, "How was your night?" And he said, "I'd lie to her and tell her oh, it was great, great, had a great time." You know, and he said he was miserable. He said she was praying for me, and I was miserable, you know. But, of course, he has come back to the Lord and led many, many people to the Lord. So it's not always, um, it's not always parents' fault. But um, I believe you have a real role to play in bringing your kids back to the Lord. I think as we spend time around tables talking to them that's an opportunity to put things into their little hearts that will never ever be gone you you share values with your children that if if you teach them when they're young the bible says when they're old they're not going to forget it they're going to remember and sometimes they're 20 years old before they respect grandma right um but 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 eventually Eventually, it's going to bear fruit. Joanne, can I say something real quick about that? Uh huh. When I, when my nephew, I have another nephew. He'll be 24 on the seventh of this month, and he's never forgot it. One year, I came to his birthday party unannounced. He didn't know I was coming. Nobody knew, but my sister Lisa brought me. And it was his last time he was going to be in town because he was moving to Florida. Well, I had money that I always give him, but I didn't have a car. He looked at me, since he was walking and talking, I always gave him a birthday card with scripture in it and words of how I felt and how he felt to me. <laughs> and how I was always proud of him. Well, that day I didn't have any. He was turning 21, and I didn't have any car for him. He looked at me and he says, well, he says, I got news for you. I'll take the money, but you better send me a card to Florida <laughs> with all the words you always give me. He never forgot it. For Isn't that sweet? Years. Isn't that sweet, Kathy? Yeah. I love that because those words were of more value to him than the money you gave yeah. That is really sweet. Um, oh, I had a note here. They began the prayer movement on February the 2nd, 2022. Two, two, 2022. Two is a number that represents unity and agreement. And so as we come into agreement for our children and for our families, I believe God is God is working. He's working in every one of those lives that I just flipped over there. Uh, there's no magic formula. You know, God doesn't create magic. He works situations. He goes so much deeper. He goes so much deeper. And that's the um, the beauty of, of what God does. He's always working in our lives. How many of you have ever heard of Lou Engel? He's, he's yeah. done a lot of prayer movements and, and things around the United States. Well, he has five sons. Four of them were really on fire for God in active ministry, but one of them, um, he's still contending for, he's still a prodigal. Joy. But he's still believing that God is in hot pursuit of his sons. <coughs> Let me finish. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter how powerful a ministry you might have, you can still have a prodigal. And and that's that's just what we have to do. We have to see it afar off. We have to just keep contending for the ones that we love, that we wrote on this list. Yes, it's, it's just like with Jessica, my first one that lives in El Paso. We had a, we didn't have a mother and daughter relationship. 
um, until my grandmother talked to her and told her, one day I'm not going to be here, but you have to make amends with your mom. She did the best that she could. She did not lie to you, because she found a letter that I had wrote to my grandmother, and Jessica thought that I had abandoned her to give her to her. Uh -huh. But that wasn't that wasn't it. Yeah. My I made a promise to my grandfather that I was gonna leave her with them because they didn't he didn't want to go through what he went through with me mm -hmm. until she asked me that question. And ever since then we've been mm -hmm. she's been very close. Very close to me. Awesome. And now that she's in a wheelchair, she's she does have her ups and her downs with me, but I said yeah, everybody has ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but <laughs> that, at the back she says, Mom, that doesn't mean that I don't love you, Mom. Right. That's right. Cool. Prayer movements throughout history have brought change to the world. Francis Frangipine, Frangipine, how do I know? Anybody know how to say his Frangipine. name? Frangipine. Frangipine, I don't know, I did a study on revivals. And he found every revival had a prayer movement that launched the revival, except one. And that was the, the Jesus movement of the 1970s. And he began to ask God about that. And he said, God, um, what birthed that revival? And God spoke to him and said, during the 1960s, when many young people were joining the hippie culture and drugs and free love, parents began to pray. Family altars began to come alive, and God saw fires coming out of houses where, where parents were interceding for their children. Amen. They began to travail in prayer, and as they spent time at the family altars, God began to move in a mighty way across this nation. And as we begin our own family altars, who knows what God has planned for the next generation. Maybe God is starting a new fire in America in a new way to begin a new revival. As we begin to spend time with God, our hearts will be touched, our ears will hear, and our eyes will see the God, things that God is doing. God will direct our path and give us instruction. You know, we just so need to hear Him because He will lead us. He knows where He's going. We don't know where He's going. When I take my dog out for a walk, she doesn't seem to know where I'm going. <laughs> I have to show her every single day which way to go. And you know, we're just like my old dog. God takes us out every day, and he says, no, I'm going this way. Come with me. Follow me. Follow me. <laughs> so how do we find a spot of our own to spend time with God? First of all, look around your house right now. When you get home, look around. Find a spot that's peaceful, that's quiet, that's comfortable where you can just uh, just enjoy a few minutes with God. Um, make it intentional. Do, do it intentionally. We, we set a meal out before our family. And I know a lot of you probably eat in front of the television or on a TV tray or hold it, you know. Set a table, you know, prepare for them. Um, prepare a place for the Lord to come and meet you. Make it a, maybe an easy chair, maybe a, a bench out in your garden, maybe a, I don't know, maybe a place, to, maybe you have a lake to go down to. There's, I know Serena has a lake over there. Maybe there's a good spot if you're close enough to go sit by the water. It's peaceful and just spend time with God. Maybe a counter in your kitchen where you can have a cup of coffee and your Bible and journal and pen. Um, chair next to a window. Someplace comfortable, someplace peaceful, where you can just enjoy spending a little bit of time with God. It doesn't matter where you select. Just make it a habit to be with God. Uh, she tells a story in her book about a pastor, and I believe it was in Colorado. He woke up early one morning, and um, God spoke to him and said, you get your family out now, yeah. now. And he, he knew God's voice. He knew that voice enough to trust it, to get his family up, I think it was 4 o'clock in the morning, get his family up, get him in the car, and get out now. Wow. That's, that is trust in God, isn't it, when you do that? Within two hours, a dam, I believe it was a dam had broken and flooded that valley where they lived, wiped away his house, the land it was on, everything. The 100-year flood. The 100-year flood. The Thompson River. Is that what it was? Yep. 
everything they owned was wiped out. They would have been dead in two hours if he hadn't stopped and listened to God. I, I, was, I was thinking I should, I should just put a recording of a voice up here and have you guys tell me who it is. If I were to play Elvis Presley's voice, could everybody in the room tell me it was Elvis Presley? If I were to record, put a uh, recording of David's voice in here, most of you would be able to recognize that immediately. Yep. That's his voice. We've heard it enough, we recognize it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. Because we've heard it. That's how familiar we need to be with God's voice, that when he speaks, we know it's him. We know his voice. If we're his sheep, the Bible says, my sheep know my voice. Um, as you begin to set aside a time for God in your life, he will set aside time for you. Uh, David gets up every morning around somewhere between 4.30 and 5.30, somewhere in there. And he comes down here to the church to pray. And he says when he opens that door, he can feel the presence of the Lord. The minute he walks in, he can just feel the presence of the Lord waiting for him. He said, it's such a privilege, it's such an honor to know that the God of all the universe is waiting for him. Because he has determined to set aside a time. He does this every day, except Sunday morning because we're, we're getting ready and coming down here for church. He doesn't usually come Sundays, but virtually every day of the week, he comes down here and prays and um, spends time with God for a couple of hours. On page 211, if you want to turn, if you have a book, you want to turn to the back of it. Uh, Lorraine was saying she liked the way this was set up, and I do too. There's a lot of, a lot of things at the end of the book that just kind of, Sometimes you need a kick start, you know what I mean? It's not that we're going to pray these every single day, but it's a great way to get started in a, in a in family altar, in your own altar, in prayers, and it triggers things in our minds and things that we need to pray for that we might not automatically think of. But here on day two, she has praying scripture. You know, um, scripture is the word of God, isn't it? It's his words. And David was saying Sunday, uh, the, the verse his mom always quoted to him, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, whatever. Anyway, she would always quote that to them when they were fighting as kids. And, uh, and he says, you know, the, ver the word is powerful. He never forgot that verse, okay? I don't have a quote. I can't quote it by heart, but he can <laughs> because his mama quoted to him all the time. And he says, but it's two-edged. She said, my dad, he said, I would tell my dad, provoke not your children to anger. <laughs> and, uh, I'm not sure how far that went with his dad. But, <laughs> but God's word is powerful. And when God speaks it, we can claim it. You know, when God wrote it, if he gives you a promise, you can claim that promise. Uh, 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we have asked of him. So when we are praying scripture back to God, we are praying according to his will. Because that is what he has spoken to us and given to us. Um, I find it interesting, though, that this implies he doesn't have to hear us. How many of you have been so grateful that God didn't answer the prayer you prayed? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord, you didn't answer that one. <laughs> he doesn't have to hear every prayer you pray. That's the reason it's so important for us to stop and hear the mind of God. Read the word. Get a word from the Lord. Claim that word before God. And then we know we're praying according to his will. Um, sometimes we pray things that are just foolish and harmful. And we, that's not the prayers we want God to answer. And he doesn't want to answer those either. He knows what's best for us. Sometimes children ask, but I want ice cream before dinner. I really like ice cream before dinner. And Mama says, no, honey, you're going to have to eat your dinner first because she knows if he eats ice cream, he won't eat any healthy foods because he's going to be full. So, you know, God knows the same thing for us. 
Um, when you begin to set time aside for yourself, when you build yourself, you're going to build your family. You're going to build your marriage. You're going to build your community. Um, you're setting a, an example for everybody around you when you decide to do what's right. We're no longer children. We can no longer behave like children. And yet, I see a lot of adults who behave like children. They haven't learned to grow up yet. But as we bring ourselves into that discipline of serving God, we make an, we make an impact on everybody we're around. Uh, she tells how she get, would get up early because her life was so busy. And she'd get up at 4 o'clock and sneak past her little girl's room and go in to pray. And before she knew what was happening, here comes Nicole. And, what you doing, Mommy? And, of course, she just wanted to get her back in bed. Go back to bed, Nicole. Go back in. And she finally decided, oh, it's just taking me all my time. So she just had Nicole curl up next to her and, and pray with her. And what an example she was setting for that little girl. That she would get up early and pray. And her little girl saw that. Her, her little girl, she was putting something in Nicole that she couldn't have put in her any other way. Um, she said Hal was a, a walker. He would walk the neighborhoods and put Nicole on his shoulders and walk the neighborhoods and pray. He was, he was putting something within her. When I was growing up, um, we always had regular prayer times. Our, our family's custom was to come into the living room before we went to bed and we would sit around in the living room, my dad would read something out of the Bible, and then when we'd kneel down where we were at, and we would pray. And that was our custom, always. Many times I would come home from school, and my mom would be kneeling at the couch and praying. Uh, David talks about coming home from school, and his mom would be at the couch praying, and his dad would be walking up and down the hall with his hands raised, just praising God and worshiping God and praying. Um, you know, these are, these are heritages that our parents put within us because we saw it. My parents would have prayer meetings at our house. They'd invite people over. They'd just pray for needs that they had, you know? I mean, that wasn't odd at all in, in their day and age. It seems to be odd in our day and age, but it wasn't odd for them to get together just to pray. <coughs> but that's a heritage that our parents passed down to us. Um, what about grandparents? Do they come to? Grandparents are very powerful in the lives of those little children. You bet they are. Yes, Keith Wooden has written a book, Teaching Children to Pray. And that might be a really good resource for you. And then I mentioned this um, a couple of weeks ago, but this little book, Eyes to Hear, Eyes to See and Ears to Hear, by Jennifer Toledo. And, and it's a book on teaching children how to hear God's voice, how to see what God is doing. Very simple. Simple things you can do with children to teach them. Um, you know, the, the, the last thing in the world that I want to have happen is for my grandchildren to grow up and not serve God. I want them to serve God. And so I pray for them. I mean, they're in my little journal. I pray for them all the time. I pray for them to, that God would, would direct their paths, that God would send the right spouse into their life. I'm praying for their spouse right now. I prayed for Ashley long before she was born. Did you know that? I prayed for Clint, uh, probably not before he was born, but when Janine was just a baby. Um, I began praying that God would, God would be with a person that, that was also growing up, that would be her spouse. And I prayed for him not knowing who he was until they got married. And I just see God's hand on both of these young people through their lives. And I believe a lot of it was because I was praying for them long before I met them. And I believe that you can see the same thing. Um, so we talked about setting aside a place. Decide ahead of time. When are you going to do this? Because if you don't make an appointment with yourself and with God, it, it'll go away. Time goes so fast. I can't believe how quickly time goes by. And you have to make an appointment with God. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be an hour. It doesn't have to be two hours. It doesn't have to take all day, although you can be in prayer all day. But set aside a few minutes, maybe when you get up in the morning. Maybe, maybe reading through the Bible in a year is too much for you. Maybe you don't have that much time. It does take quite a bit of time to read five chapters out of the Bible. And a lot of times we're reading it so fast we don't get anything out of it. So if that's not for you, don't do it. 
do a shorter study. Decide on one book of the Bible. Maybe, maybe you want to study John. So, so make, it, make it an effort to read the book of John at a pace that you can do it, that you can get something out of it. It's so much more valuable to get something out of the Word than just to read it and not get anything out of it. Let God speak to you. Before you begin to read, have everything in one place. Get a little basket. Put your Bible, put your journal, put a pen, um, put, put a little, you know, a few things that you might need. Maybe a, maybe a Bible dictionary or some little study thing in there. There's a little Bible dictionary I just ordered. It was $6. Uh, hardcover Bible dictionary. Just cool. I'm, I'm just excited to get into it. But, but it's just, um, I think it's actually a little bit smaller than this book, so it would fit in a little, little basket. That way everything's together. You know what I'm saying? If you've got it spread here and there and someplace else, it takes you all of your time getting your materials together so you can have your devotional time. So keep it together in one spot. Um, then, if you decide you want to go someplace else, all you have to do is pick up your basket, go to another spot where you're comfortable. First thing you do, minimize distractions. Turn your phone off, turn the TV off. Um, Excuse me, don't play games, don't do email, don't do social media. Those things are time killers, I kid you not. Uh, they will destroy all of your time. Um, start with prayer. Just begin to uh, ask God before you read anything in the Bible. Ask Him to show you. How many of you have read stuff and you don't have a clue what you've read? It didn't mean anything to you. I don't even know what that means, God. You know, we've all done that. And I'm just going to tell you, just stop and ask God, show me what this, for what I'm reading, reveal it to me. Show me what you want me to get out of this word today. Um, then read your Bible. And don't read it so fast that you don't know what you, what you read. If all you read is one verse and you get something out of it, you've been blessed. Okay? I just want to encourage you to, I think it's good to read through the whole Bible. It gives you a good feel for, for the history of the Jewish nation, to, for, the, for how the Bible is, how the Word is put together. I think it's a good exercise. But if you don't have time for that, make time for something. Meditate on what you read. How does that apply to your life? How is God going to use that verse in your life today? Pray as you read. Ask God to speak to you. Ask Him, what, what do you want to say to me today? What are you speaking to me, Lord? Um, and pray the scripture back to Him. You know, how many parents, how many of us, <laughs> when our kids come back and tell us what we told them, oh, powerful. It's powerful. We're not... God already knows what His Word said. He wants us to know what it says and claim it. He gave it to us for a reason. Journal. What is God speaking to you? Write it down. I'm telling you, if you don't write it down, you'll lose it. Uh, I think I'm going to remember my grocery list. I've only got three things on it, and I go to the grocery store, and by the time I get there, I've forgotten two of them. You know? So how much more are we going to forget the wonderful good things that God has said to us? Thank you for laughing. It's the most. That's the most I've gotten out of you guys all day. Before, Thank you. Before, I go, before I go to the store, I have what I'm gonna just get, and I end up getting. I know we all do. Don't ever go shopping when you're hungry, for sure. Memorize verses. Put God's word in your heart so that later on, and it doesn't have to be word for word. We can we can abbreviate them, God. I'm telling you, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I believe that, Lord. My prayers are effectual and fervent, God. You hear them. I know you hear my prayers. James tells me you hear my prayers. Um, I'm not great at memorizing things word for word, but, but I want his word in my heart. And So the more I work at it, the more I put into me. Live it out. As you get it from that few minutes of prayer time, Spend the rest of your day living out what God showed you that morning. It's going to change you. It's going to change your family. It's going to change the world. Um, so I'm going to pray over you real quickly, and then I'm going to have you split up. On page 79 in the book is the activation for this chapter. 
and then I'm just going to have you guys share with each other what's worked for you, what hasn't worked for you, what are you going to do? Are you going to try something new to try to jump start it? You know, there's no condemnation. It's like with a diet. Okay, I ruined it yesterday. I'm going to start again today. Uh, you know, you just you do the best you can. We're all people. We're all flawed. We all have crazy schedules. Even those that are retired have crazy schedules, just in case you guys didn't know it. All right, sometimes schedules get crazier when you retire than before. <laughs> but let me pray over you, Numbers 6, 24 through 26, okay? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Shalom. Thank you.